Hello, everyone. Welcome to the NFL Week 7 episode of the Bacon Bets podcast. Uh, I have good news and bad news. Let's start with the good news. The good news is uh, I have been profitable for the third straight week after uh, finishing with a profit and a winning record in Week 6. Before I tell you the bad news, I need to tell you to subscribe to the YouTube channel if you're watching this on YouTube. If you're listening to this, rate and review the podcast, the audio version, then search up Bacon Bets podcast on YouTube, then subscribe to the YouTube channel. That would be much appreciated. Uh, I've been profitable four of these six weeks so far this NFL season. Now, the bad news is, yes, I've been profitable for three straight weeks. Uh, but once again, not a lot of profit. Uh, a winning week is a winning week. And as I always say in gambling, if you're not losing, you're winning. Um, but this week, it's it was a bit of a heartbreaker because I was sitting at eight and five heading into Sunday Night Football. All I really needed was to win one of the two primetime games, either uh, Sunday Night Football or Monday Night Football, to finish with a nice little profit of around uh, two and a half units. Uh, but I lost both. Uh, winning both would have been amazing. Would have been turning into a great week. Uh, lost both. So finished with a record of eight and seven since there were 15 games this week for plus .49 units. Once again, I'm not going to complain. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to apologize for winning. Uh, but it, I just wish... Uh, I had another big week like week one where I won a ton of money. Um, so we are sitting still in the profit, uh, well in the profit, uh, heading into week seven of the NFL season. Our season to date record is 49, 42, uh, and two. 49 wins, 42 losses, two pushes for plus 4.88 units. So we're still up almost five units on the year. Um, just wish a couple of games could have went my uh, way uh, this weekend, ones that, that I thought we deserved to win, but uh, the bounces just didn't quite go our way. The Chargers, and I just tweeted this out like right before I went live, uh, the Chargers play the exact same game every single time. It's like literally every single Chargers game is the same. It's back and forth. They look good. They look bad. And then they get a chance to win the game late and they blow it and then don't win. And Justin Herbert throws an interception or they don't get on fourth down and they lose like a field by field goal. Every single week is the exact same thing. I feel like I'm just like, like when you're watching a movie 20 times in a row, I don't know how many movies you guys have watched 20 times in a row. I think the only one maybe I've watched, maybe not 20 times in a row, but 20 times overall is like Napoleon Dynamite. This is what it feels like watching the Chargers. Uh, it's, I just feel like I'm watching the same movie. I feel like I can recite it line for line. When they got the ball back with a little over two minutes left uh, against the Cowboys tonight, I was like, they're not going to win this game. Justin Herbert's probably going to throw an interception or they're going to fail on a fourth down chance or someone's going to fumble and they're not going to win the game. Again, um, but I keep betting on them. Am I going to bet on them this week against the Chiefs? Stay tuned to find out. Um, and then there, there were a couple games. I'm going to introduce a new segment. Um, luckiest win of the week and most heartbreaking loss of the week. As a little way to recap some of my picks. Uh, so let's do that now. Let's start since we're on the topic. Most heartbreaking loss of the week I thought was the Seattle Seahawks uh, against the Bengals. They were my underdog pick of the week. I thought they outplayed the Bengals, they dominated them in yards per play. Let me see if I can bring it up here. Uh, what the, Now, obviously, I know yards per play is not everything. I, I try to say that as much as possible. But still, it stings when you have when you bet on a team as a money line underdog. And they owe oh, ESPN automatically playing the music every time you go to an ESPN box score. Nothing makes me more angry than an autoplay video that is auto volume. Hate it. Uh, 5.4 yards per play compared to the Bengals, 4.0. So over 1.4 more yards per play in the Bengals. Couldn't win. Uh, going one for five in the red zone is what did it. That kills you. Uh, Bengals are now, might be my number two most fraudulent team since people seem to think the Bengals have turned things around and that they're the Bengals of old. Uh-uh. Nope. Unfortunately, can't bet against them this week because they have a bye week. Uh, but I can assure you, uh, who do the Bengals? I think that don't they play the 49ers next? Yeah, I will be taking the 49ers. Um, so I would say Seahawks, my most heartbreaking loss of the week. I thought that was one that we really deserved to win and didn't. You could throw in the Panthers there for plus 13 and a half. Got up 14 nothing. I tweeted, is it too early to count Panthers plus 13 and a half as a win? Spoiler alert, it was. Um, Dolphins scored 35 straight points. Um, ended up winning 42-21. Uh, luckiest win. So let's go the opposite side because, of course, uh, luck 
falls on both sides of the spectrum. Uh, people like to point out uh, bad luck a lot more often than they like to point out when they get good luck. When, you know, a coin flip goes your way, you like to take credit for it. When it goes against you, you like to blame it on the refs or say it was bad luck um, or something like that. So let, let me let me play both sides of it. What would be my luck? Luckiest win of the week, I would say, would be I somehow won Browns plus five. I bet Browns plus five early in the week to Sean Watson was ruled out. I think it closed Browns plus nine and a half. So I lost four and a half points of CLV closing line value. Generally not a good spot to be in. Um, but then the Browns still ended up beating the 49ers outright. So bit of a lucky. And also that's a weird game too. A lot of penalties, a lot of injuries for the 49ers. That was one that based on the closing line, I should not, I did not deserve to win a plus five bet, but they, I it ended up winning and they won outright. Uh, luckiest win chiefs, uh, scored a field goal late uh, in the game to kind of get, uh, well, I guess you wouldn't call that a backdoor cover, but they did, um, get a cover late in the game against the Broncos on Thursday night. A little bit of luck there. Um, yeah, that was just about it for lucky wins. I think, uh, the over between Washington and Atlanta should have hit that looked like it was hitting all game. And then they just stopped scoring. Uh, more on Atlanta in a little bit. Uh, but so yeah, there you have it. At the end of the day, I mean, a winning week is a winning week. I'm not going to complain too much about a winning week, but obviously I'd like to win a little bit more than half a unit. But we march on. Uh, profitable four of these six weeks. Um, if you don't already know, there are 272 NFL regular season games. I bet on all 272 of them. This week, in week seven, uh, we only have 13 games. I don't think there are any uh, weeks where we have fewer than 13 games. So a pretty late slate this week uh four different teams are on by uh let me see if i can bring up the list of teams that aren't a buy it is the i know the Bengals. i already mentioned them they're on by the panthers the cowboys the texans the jets and the titans so 13 games this week i got a bet for all 13 of them locked in by the way last week my best bets if you just follow my five best bets which i give out at the end of the show went three and two we won chiefs lions and vikings lost seahawks and colts also the teaser of the week last week hit uh seahawks plus eight and a half first Bengals. they didn't cover but they did cover the teaser leg and then rams uh a pick em against the cardinals that obviously won they won and covered the normal spread uh so yeah let's jump into week seven of the road to 272 bets, I got my best bet for all 13 games. I will recap them at the end of the show and then give you my five best bets, my teaser, and then we'll talk a little Survivor to close things out. So um, once again, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, like the video, rate and review the podcast. I appreciate all of you who do that. Um, let's jump into it. The road to 272 bets continues. <gasps> I'm not a state. I'm a monster. <laughs> no, Lisa. The only monster here is the gambling monster that has enslaved your mother. I call him Gamblor, and it's time to snatch your mother from his neon claws. All uh, right, of course, we will start with Thursday night football. Uh, it is the Jaguars. It is the Saints. Obviously, as a Falcons fan, I'll be cheering against the Saints. Uh, my heart will be, uh, but my money is on the Saints. I got the Saints minus one at minus 110 against the Jaguars. Now, I do have a little bit of a confession to make for this pick. 99% of the time, I don't lock in my bet until right before I record uh, the podcast. It's usually uh, I'm going through in a handicap game by game. So at the late, uh, or usually at the earliest, like two hours before I hit record in the podcast is when I will lock in a bet. I will admit I locked in this bet uh, earlier in the day on Monday. So already I'm recording this. It's moved up to Saints minus three. Um, I'm sorry. I knew the line was going to move. The report came out that Trevor Lawrence is questionable to play on Thursday night. I knew if I wait, I wanted to bet the Saints anyway. Um, and I knew if I waited until tonight that the line was going to move. So I jumped on the Saints early Monday morning. Sue me. I'm sorry. At the end of the day, I am trying to <laughs> make money as best as I can. I don't bet when the lines are first released on released on Sunday night, which would be the most beneficial thing for me to do, but I don't. I Like I said, 99% of the time, I wait till Monday night. This one, I knew the line was going to move. I knew minus one was a good number, uh, so that's what I bet on that. Um, I will say minus three, I still do like the Saints. I think if you like the Saints as well, it wouldn't be a terrible idea to bet it now because if Trevor L uh, Lawrence, who is questionable right now, is uh, completely ruled out, then this line's probably going to move to four, four and a half, I would guess. So 
If you like the Saints, don't be afraid to bet them now. I would still bet the Saints now at minus three. If I didn't lock it in earlier uh, this morning, Monday morning, I would have locked it in tonight at Saints minus three. So I got it at minus one for the sake of my record. Um, overall, I, I mean, I do like it at minus three as well. Because uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars are the number one most fraudulent team in the NFL. Uh, they have taken over the Dallas Cowboys, who after beating the Chargers on Monday night are probably going to move up my fraudulent rankings. Uh, but three most fraudulent teams in the NFL right now might be Cowboys 3, Bengals 2, Jaguars 1. The Jaguars have won three straight games. People are starting to look at them again as a contender. And in all three of those games... They were out gained by their opponents and yards per play. I know yards per plays and everything. Third down efficiency, red zone efficiency, turnovers, all of those play a huge role. But still, you can't win. Uh, getting out gained by your opponents and yard per, yards per play is not a sustainable strategy long term. You can't continue to win games if you're going to get out gained every single game that you play in. So. Uh, three weeks ago, the Falcons out gained them five yards per play to 4.7 yards per play. Uh, last week against the Bills, the Bills out gained them 7.2 yards per play to 5.8 yards per play. And then this week against the Colts, uh, they were out gained uh, 4.7 yards per play to 3.8 yards per play. Now, obviously, last week with the Bills and this week, well, actually, all three games, turnovers were made a huge difference. Uh, this week, the Colts turned the ball over four times. I mean, that's a really easy way to overcome a yards per play deficit is to force your opponent to turn the ball over four times. But like I've talked about in the past, I still think turnovers are more of a result of a bad play and a mistake by the offense more so than the defense making a play. Um, so because of that, I think the Jaguars are one of the more overrated teams or the most overrated team in the NFL in net yards per play, 26th in the NFL are the Jacksonville Jaguars, right below the Chicago Bears, right above the Washington Commanders. So no, I will not be betting on the Jaguars, especially with Trevor Lawrence questionable, and he, even if he does play, who knows what kind of shape he's going to be in. Who even is? Is it C.J. Bathard is still um, the backup quarterback for the Jaguars? Is he going to play on Thursday night if it's uh, not Trevor Lawrence? I mean, I don't have a lot of faith in that. Yeah, it should be... Um, the Canadian guy. Why am I blanking on the Canadian guy? Played for the BC Lions in the CFL. Who I think is now on the practice squad. He should be the number two guy. I don't know why I'm blanking on his name. Um, but the Saints. I mean, I still have faith in the Saints. They got to get something going offensively. Because they are too good on paper offensively. To just put up dud performance after dud performance. Um, they got the, the names on offense. They got the players on offense. They once again didn't show up against the Texans. Uh, I mean, making Derek Carr throw the ball 50 times probably isn't ideal. Um, but yeah, yards per play, they okay. The, like they, they have all the fundamentals and even some of the metrics line up with the Saints being a good offense, but they just don't get it done. Um, red zone specifically, 0 for 3 in the red zone against the Texans this past week. I haven't looked it up. I don't have it in my notes, but I'm going to look up red zone uh, touchdown scoring percentage for the Saints right now. I bet you it's going to be one of the worst marks in the NFL. 27th. Only score a touchdown of 36.8% of their red zone trips. That's that. It's hard to win and cover spreads when you're doing that. Can they fix that issue? I have faith that they can, especially against a Jaguars team uh, that is overrated. Um, and Saints defense, still one of the better units in the NFL so far this season. So I'll take the Saints minus one. Uh, I like it at the minus three number as well uh, against the Jaguars. Uh, if it gets to... If it gets to four, four and a half with Lawrence officially ruled out, that makes sense. If it gets four to four, four and a half, and he hasn't officially been ruled out, I'd probably buy back a little bit on the Jaguars. But I like the Saints. Uh, moving on to the Sunday slate. Uh, it is the Browns and the Colts, and I will take the under 39 and a half. Uh, obviously, a low total with it being at 39 and a half. Still like the under, though. Because as dominant as the Miami Dolphins offense has been this season, the Browns have had an equally dominant defense, but not as many people are talking about it for some reason. Everyone's talking about the Dolphins offense. I mean, obviously that's more exciting than a dominant defense. But if you look at opponent EPA per play for the Browns, they're in first at minus two po uh, 0.249. The next closest is the Ravens at minus 0.161. Almost like a full... I know, what is that? Tenth better than the next best team, which is huge. 
uh, an opponent EPA per play. Also, if you want to look at some more straightforward statistics, first in opponent yards per play, fourth in opponent yards per carry, second in opponent yards per pass attempt, first in opponent third down conversion rate. Teams are only converting third downs in the first downs on 23.08% of third down chances against them. Unbelievable. Their defense has been lights out. Now, because of that, you might be asking why I'm not just betting on the Browns to win and cover the two-point spread. Well, it's because their offense has been bad. Um, 28th in yards per play, 30th in EPA per play. We don't really know the status of their quarterback, so I don't really want to lay points on the Browns against anyone uh, when they don't have an offense because to, you're asking them to not only win, but win with margin. I don't have faith unless a team has a, at least an average offense to go with a good defense. I don't really have faith in them to do that. Now, if they're in a situation like last week where they're getting a ton of points against a 49ers team, then the defense should be good enough to at least keep them in the game. But now betting on them as a favorite, I don't trust their offense to kind of uh, win with margin or be able to lead them to win with margin. So instead of doing that, I will take the obvious bet, which is to just bet the under. That's the obvious play when you have a really good defense and a really bad offense. It has worked for me so far this season. Uh, and the Colts are kind of just below average at everything. I don't really know what to think of the Colts. All the AFC South teams, I don't really know what to think of because none of their metrics are really great at anything. Um, I'll take the under 39 and a half between the Cleveland Browns and Indianapolis Colts. AFC East, Bills minus 8.5 at the New England Patriots. This is a road game for the Bills. Now, I'm in a weird spot with a few teams this week where if you listen to previous years' editions of the Road to 272 Bets, there's nothing I like to do than be a bit of a contrarian and zig when a lot of other people are zagging and buy low on teams. But I at least need some kind of metric to support that decision. I can't just bet on teams off vibes. Uh, off buy low vibes and think they're going to turn things around. Usually I like to buy low in teams of bad records, but some strengths and some metrics. There's teams this week that I want to buy low on, but I just can't find a reason to do it. And the Patriots are one of those teams. I can't find a reason to actually bet on them as much as my gut wants me to. So I have to take the Bills minus eight and a half. Now I know that I said um, I would take the under in Patriots games until they until the totals get to the 30s this is a spot to potentially do that with it still at 41 and a half i don't hate the under but the patriots are in a little bit of a weird spot i've been looking at advanced numbers a lot more which you might be able to tell this year like epa and success rate and things like that and while these simple stats like opponent yards per play and um you know opponent third down conversion rate all those kinds of like more simple stats favor the patriots but the advanced numbers don't which makes me nervous and which maybe I should just trust my old strategy and just stick to mostly simple numbers, but like opponent EPA per play, um, the Patriots are 15th, like not a top 10 defense, which is what you see when you look at more simple stats. So the advanced numbers love the bills, uh, offensively, uh, the bills have the third rank third in EPA per play. The Patriots are dead last. So if you look at EPA per play, we have the best offense against, or sorry, the third best offense against the worst offense. Defensively, even the uh, opponent EPA per play numbers uh, favor the Bills. They come at eight, uh, in at eighth. Patriots come in at 15th. And I'm a numbers guy. I, I, I think in this spot, I think I'm going to trust some of the advanced numbers that show the Bills are a far, far, far superior team to the Patriots. And still the Patriots week after week do not do anything to give me any level of faith in their offense. Um, how many points do they have to score against the Raiders who are, do not have a good defense? 17 points against the Raiders, one of the worst defenses in the NFL outside of like Max Crosby. Zero points against the Saints the week before. Three points against the Cowboys the week before. I mean, are they averaging the fewest points per game this season? It's got to be close. And while the Bills had a little bit of a hiccup this past week, Patriots averaging 12 points per game this season, second last of the Giants are averaging 11.8. Although the Bills had a little bit of a hiccup against the Giants this past week, um, I, I, just, I, just, I just can't take the Patriots. There's nothing I, I, I can find to support a bet on the Patriots. So I'll take the Bills minus 8.5, minus 110. It is the Raiders against the Bears. 
And I'm going to take the over 37 and a half at minus 105 over or totals that are in the 30s, especially, I mean, borderline mid 30s, 37 and a half. These totals should be saved for teams that have good defenses. Now, I know this has a chance of being a battle between backup quarterbacks. Justin Fields is doubtful for the Bears. Um, so that would leave uh, what's his face, that rookie who like set D2 records in as a starting quarterback for the Bears. The Raiders, I think Jimmy Garoppolo should be good to go, but he might not. So uh, who is it going to be? Brian Hoyer? My point is, it could be a battle of backup quarterbacks, and I don't care. This could be a Nathan Peterman versus Nathan Peterman's cl uh, clone game, and I would still take the over because even if you accept that both offenses are bad, for a total to be in the 30s, we need also both defenses to at least be average, and they're not. These are two of the worst defenses in the NFL. The Raiders are 25th in opponent EPA per play. The Bears are 31st in opponent EPA per play. The only team that's worse than that stat is the Broncos. They're also 17th and 29th in opponent yards per play. So advanced metrics, simple metrics, everything points towards both defenses being bad. I don't care that the offenses aren't good. I'm not trusting defenses to keep this total to under 37 and a half. This is, is it might be the lowest total of the season, maybe? If not, it's up there, top three. So I think this is ridiculous. I'll take the over 37 and a half. I guess we're going to root for bad teams to score points in this one, but I think that's the play to make. Um, we got the another bad game. Commanders and the Giants. I talked about earlier how there are bad teams that I wish I could bet on this week. I, the Giants are one of them. I wish I could you know, buy low on a Giants team who did manage to cover against the Bills on Sunday night. But then the odds makers only make them two-point underdogs. I can't back them as two-point underdogs at all. Wash and I felt like we're actually a little bit overvalued the first couple weeks. Now I think they might be a little bit undervalued. Um, the Giants still dead last uh, by a mile in net yards per play at minus two. Uh, and the biggest weakness of the Giants offense, we know this, is their offensive line. But now they face the biggest strength of the commander's weak defense is their pass rush. Uh, 11th in sack percentage, taking down the opposing quarterback on 8.41% of their dropbacks. Um, so that's it's a strength against a weakness here from when, it, when you look at the commander's defense compared to the Giants offense. So I'll take the commanders as a very slight favorite, two-point favorite, minus 108 on the road against the Giants. I, I Like I said, I wish we were getting like four points on the Giants. Then I, I, I would probably back them. Um, but under a field goal, oh, oh, I just, I can't, I can't bring myself to do it. And I might regret it. There's a very good chance that all these shitty teams that everyone thinks are terrible in which the metrics show are terrible, all cover this week. And I'm going to be pissed if I'm not on it. It's possible. But I need some numbers. I need something. I need something to bet on these teams. Um, let's move on to the NFC South, my Atlanta Falcons. Now, obviously as a Falcons fan, I follow a lot of Falcons beat writers, a lot of Falcons people on Twitter. Um, I go to the Falcons, uh, subreddit and I'm kind of surprised by how a lot of Falcons fans are treating this team. They're mad. Uh, they hate Arthur Smith. They hate Desmond Ritter. They're asking them to just completely strip down and start from the start. It's like, Guys, the Falcons, we expected the Falcons to be a borderline playoff team heading into the season where making the playoffs was going to be considered a huge success. And that's exactly what this team is through the first six weeks. They're a 3-3 three and three team, a borderline playoff team that still has a very good chance to make the playoffs. But we're not going to be a top-tier contender. Our most veteran offensive player outside of quarter, like, well, and he's not a starter. So, like, our most veteran skill position starter is... Kyle Pitts is in his third year. Drake London, second year. Um, Desmond Ritter, second year. Kyle Pitts, third year. We don't really have a number two, a good number two wide out. It's a young quarterback. It's a head coach who's still early in his career. They're going to make some mistakes. In this past week, they could have beat the Commanders, and they made some mistakes. It's going to happen. Arthur Smith allowed the, the offense to have two delay of game penalties when they are close to the uh, goal line. Desmond Ritter threw three interceptions. I don't think all of them were his fault. One of them was Bijan Robinson's fault, fault, in my opinion. It's going to happen. Not every game is going to go perfectly. Um, with that being said, I will bet on the Falcons this week, plus two and a half, minus 106 
against the Buccaneers. I think this game is going to come down to the wire. I think these two teams are comparable in a lot of different ways. Um, so I will take the team that's getting the points. Now, the issue with the Buccaneers, and which is why I bet on the Lions against them last week, is they can't run the football at all. Still dead last in the NFL in yards per carry, getting just three yards per rush. Which means for them to win games, they need Baker. They need all the pressure to be on Baker Mayfield's shoulders. And Baker Mayfield is not a guy that's going to play a good game every single week. And then we saw what happened last week against the Lions when he didn't play a great game. They lost. By a lot. Uh, so I would stay away from them. The Buccaneers are going to be good bets against really bad teams. But they're going to struggle against good defenses. And guess what, guys? The Falcons' defense is actually good. Uh, it's their offense that is the reason why they're only 3-3. Three and three. Their defense has been like a borderline top 10, I would even say, top 10 defense in the NFL, like ninth, 10th best defense in the NFL so far this season. I think they can keep Baker Mayfield in check. I think their offense is going to learn from a lot of the mistakes they made last week. I did kind of want to take them to win outright. I did not. I just took the 2.5 points. But I feel very comfortable with that bet. Falcons plus 2.5, minus 106. And if you're a Falcons fan listening to this, Calm down. We're going to be all right. We got an easy schedule. There's going to be ups and downs with a young team like this. It's not time to push the panic button. Relax. We win this game. And if other games kind of go our way, if the Saints lose, I think that puts us in sole possession of first place in the NFC South. So let's relax. Uh, One more game, and then we're going to take a break and talk about the uh, late slate of games. But uh, let's cover this one first. It is the Ravens against the Lions. I will take the Ravens minus 3, minus 110 against the Detroit Lions. I think it is time to sell high on the Lions. Now, Lions fans, don't sewer me here. Um, I have been speaking highly uh, of your team, but now I think they're getting a little bit overvalued here. Um, I hear some people are calling them the best team in the NFC. I think that's a stretch. I think they're a very good team. I think they're a playoff team. They're going to win the NFC North. But uh, I think it's a little bit of a comeback down to earth game for the Lions against a very, very good Ravens team. Uh, Let's not forget, the Lions did beat the Chiefs in week one. Credit to them. Now, that was kind of a weird game, uh, but they did win. Uh, They lost the Seahawks in week two. And then their last four wins were against the Falcons, Packers, Panthers, and Buccaneers. Not exactly a killer's row of teams. Um, Now, some of those wins, they won handedly. Actually, I think all of them they won handedly, but still. Uh, They have played two good teams so far this season, the Chiefs and the Seahawks. And they barely won one of those games. And to be fair, they barely lost the other one. So this is going to be a true measuring stick for them. But I think... The Lions offense, especially on the road, is going to struggle with this Ravens defense because the Ravens defense has been fantastic. Um, Second in the NFL in opponent yards per play. First in the NFL in opponent yards per pass attempt. Jared Goff has a tough, tough test ahead of him. Uh, If the the Lions were home as three-point underdogs, I would like it. On the road as three-point underdogs, I do not like it. I set the Ravens as four maybe even four and a half point favorites so i think we're getting a point point and a half of value here with the ravens at minus three i know the ravens have have had their own uh, ups and downs this season but the metrics show that they are a very good team third in the nfl in net yards per play their offense if you look at if you look at epa per play their offense has not been fantastic but their defense has been very good um opponent epa per play they are second to only the browns i think uh I think the Lions will struggle against very good defenses, and I think that's what's going to happen here. So I'll take the Ravens minus three, minus 110 against the Lions. Uh, All right, let's take a quick break, and then I will come back to talk the late afternoon slate and then Sunday night and Monday night football, and then I'll give you my recap and my best bets at the the end of the show. So uh, I will be right back in just one moment. All right, let's keep things rolling with the Seahawks and the Cardinals battle of a couple of NFC West teams, I will take the Seahawks minus seven and a half and minus 110 against the Cardinals. The Cardinals, as I called last week in their game against the Rams, this is a very, very similar situation actually to last week against the Rams. The Seahawks and the Rams are actually two very similar teams in a lot of ways. Um, and this is pretty much the exact same situation. So I'm going to take the team, same team I took last week in the Rams and the Rams covered with ease. Now we do need to lay uh, an extra point on the Seahawks than we did uh, compared to the Rams. But to be fair, I think the Seahawks defense might be a little bit better than the Rams defense. But my point is the Cardinals come back down to earth. They were a frisky team through the first few weeks. 
They are covering spreads. They upset the Cowboys. Um, but their metrics are starting to fall off a cliff over the last two weeks. Um, and also, I think even more so than that, the Seahawks are a stylistic nightmare. Just like last week against the Rams, uh, the biggest weakness for the Cardinals is their secondary, and that is the, the strength of the, Seah of the Seahawks is their ability uh, to throw the ball. Cardinals are 28th in opponent yards per pass attempt, giving up 7.3 yards per throw, 8.4 yards per throw over their last three games. Now they face a Seahawks defense that is inside the top 10 in both EPA per drop back and yards per pass attempt. Uh, and then defensively, um, which kind of gives the Seahawks an advantage over the Cardinals even more so than the Rams, uh, is 42.51% of the offensive yards gained by the Cardinals this season have come on the ground. That is the third highest rate in the league. They're also second in the NFL in yards per carry, averaging 5.3 yards per rush. And now they take on a Seahawks team that is the best run defense in the entire NFL, at least in terms of opponent yards per carry, keeping teams to just 3.2 yards per rush. So the Seahawks are built perfectly to slow down what the Cardinals do well, and their offense is going to be able to exploit the biggest weakness on the Cardinals team, which is their secondary. So this is an absolute no-brainer for me. Seahawks minus 7.5 at home to the Arizona Cardinals. The other NFC West team, the Rams, if there was one game I could not bet on this week, uh, I would make it the Steelers and the Rams game, but uh, it is not called the road to 271 bets. It is the road to 272 bets. So I will bet on this game, and I'll take the over 43. Uh, the Steelers are a confusing team. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this season I've been looking at advanced metrics a lot more, like EPA per play and success rate and all those things. The easy, they're not the easy, the simple stats, like opponent yards per play, um, Steelers are one of the worst defenses in the NFL, 24th in the NFL in opponent yards per play, but the advanced metrics like the Steelers defense, they're top 10 in both like EPA per play and opponent success rate and all those things. So I, I don't really, I, 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 I don't really know what to think of them. Um, I generally lean more towards the simple statistics. I don't think the Steelers are a top 10 defense. Obviously they have TJ Watt, arguably the best defensive player in the NFL, uh, but a top 10 defense, I think, is a little bit of a stretch. So, until I can figure out the Steelers team a little bit more, uh, it's especially a weird situation with them coming off a, a bye week, I'm just going to take the over, because the Rams, I think, are going to turn into a very good over team. Now, I don't, I think they're like 3-3 three and three to the over, or 5-3-2 and two to the over. Um, if I can find this here... Uh, over under the Rams are two and four on the season to the over. I think that's, I think that's going to start to change. I think the Rams by the end of the year are going to have a winning record when it comes to the over because they are what you look for in an over. They have a very good offense. One of the best offenses in the NFL, seventh in the NFL in EPA per play, eighth in yards per play. Uh, but their defense has been one of the worst in the NFL, uh, bottom half, bottom 10 in almost every single category. So uh, because I think the Rams are going to be a good over team by, uh, when it's all said and done. And also if the Steelers offense is ever going to have a really good week, I think it's going to be, you know, when they have a week off and some time to prepare. So I'm going to sit back and root for points in this one. Steelers Rams over 43, the Jerome Bettis bowl. People forget Jerome Bettis played for the Rams. Uh, all right, next up Packers Broncos. This is the third team now that I wish I could buy low on, that I wish I could zig when everyone else is going to zag, because I, I don't know if anyone's going to bet on the Broncos as one-point underdogs in this game against the Packers. I certainly, but I can't do it. They are three-point underdogs, four-point underdogs, sure. I'll zig when everyone else zags. I'll be the contrarian. I'll be the guy trying to buy low on a team that has sucked through the first third of the season. At a one-point spread, I can't do it. I got to take the Packers here. So I'll take Packers minus one, Minus 110 against the Broncos because the worst, the uh, Broncos secondary has been the worst in the NFL and it's not even close. Even last week, I know in, in terms of the final score, they kept the Chiefs in check, but the Chiefs couldn't score in the red zone. They were moving the ball, but then just couldn't score a touchdown in the red zone. So Jordan Love, who has not really had a great year, um, who has one of the worst completion percentages in the NFL, finally gets a chance to face off against the worst secondary in the NFL. If, he's gonna, if Jordan Love's going to have a good game against anyone, it's going to be the Denver Broncos. 
Now, rumors are that the Broncos might be uh, hire a new defensive coordinator. It might be Rex Ryan, which I would love. That would be amazing. Um, of all the interviews that I've done, uh, Rex Ryan was my favorite. He was the nicest guy of everyone that I talked to. Um, he's a Leafs fan. People forget. Um, so I would love to see Rex Ryan back in the mix. One of the one of the greatest characters uh, over the past few decades in the in the NFL. But until they do bring him back, I'm going to be betting against this Broncos defense because they stink. Now the Broncos offense has actually been better than a lot of people think, but not good enough to make up for their bad defense. So I will take the Packers minus one, minus one ten. Next up. You may have noticed I've not given out a money line underdog hit this week, which is one of my rules to give out a money line underdog. Well, I'm giving out to you now. AFC West battle, Chargers Chiefs. I'm going to take the Chargers plus 210 to upset the Kansas City Chiefs. Now, this might be the equivalent of like when you lose a hand in blackjack and then you double down and double your bet size for the next hand because you're pissed off that you just lost a hand you should have won. Maybe that's what I'm doing with the Chargers after watching them lose to the Cowboys in a game I thought they should have won. I was obviously on the Chargers. So maybe now I'm just kind of doubling my bet size going and now just going to take, or at least my version of doubling my bet size is to take them on the money line at plus 210 to beat the Chiefs. But I think the Chiefs have been playing with fire a little bit the past few weeks. They're letting teams that they're far better than hang around until late in the games. I mean, the Broncos had a chance to win late in the game or at least tie it against the Chiefs, which is insane. Also, the Chiefs' schedule um, has not been a very good schedule. So, yes, if you look at a lot of metrics, they rank very high, um, but they lost the Lions in Week 1. They barely beat a fraudulent Jaguars team 17 to 9 in week 2 and then since then they've played the Bears, Jets, Vikings and Broncos Bears they beat up on obviously Jets they only beat by 3, Vikings they only beat by 7, Broncos they only beat by 9 and that was a or sorry by 11 and that was a late field goal to bring it to 11, it was a one score game basically the whole time outside of the Lions this Chargers team would be the best team that they've played so far this season. And even, I mean, you could make an argument the Chargers are the best team that they faced all season. I think the Chargers are live in this game. Their defense has gotten a lot better the past few weeks. They're even pretty solid tonight against the Cowboys. Uh, their offense, now I don't have updated numbers when I talk about games involving the team that played in Monday Night Football because all my sources don't update right after the game. They're not going to be updated until tomorrow morning. Uh, but heading into tonight... The Chargers were fourth in EPA per play on offense behind only the Dolphins, 49ers, and Bills. Now, they're probably going to drop on that because they didn't have a great offensive performance against the Cowboys, but still a very, very good offense. Their defense has been much better the past few weeks. It's a divisional matchup. It won, it's one that seems to be close every time these two teams play. I will take the Chargers to outright win as my upset pick of the week against the Chiefs. I need a big upset win, too. Uh, my money line underdog picks overall, I think, are six and six. Uh, but the big ones uh, that I title as my upset pick of the week aren't winning. I need a big one here uh, to win for me. So I'll take the Chargers plus two ten against the Chiefs, uh, which brings me to Sunday Night Football, which might be the best and most exciting game, the most anticipated game of the season. It's my personal most anticipated game of the season. It is the Dolphins and the Eagles. Let's sit back and root for points, baby. Give me the over 52 between the Dolphins and Eagles on Sunday Night Football because these two teams, believe it or not, are very similar in a lot of different ways. Uh, Both their offenses have been better than their defense. That's obvious with the Dolphins, whose offense um, has been on a historic pace, whose offense, um, if you look at the EPA per play chart, actually, I wonder if I can share my screen and show it to you guys. Um, Do I have any embarrassing tabs open that I don't want you to see? Um, no, <laughs> uh, thankfully not. Uh, let me see if I can show, um, this. Yeah, there we go. Look, the benefit of watching on YouTube. You can now see my screen, uh, and you see the site that I use rbsdm.com. Um, this is the, uh, XY chart for EPA per play. The Y-axis is rush EPA per play. The uh, X-axis is dropback EPA per play. It is the Dolphins all alone 
in the far upper right-hand corner of this chart. It is unbelievable how good their offense has been. Now, you also see on the upper right uh, quadrant is the Eagles. Um, now, their uh, running game has been a little bit more effective than their pass game, but still, they are gaining... Uh, they're in the positive for EPA per play for both rush and pass offense. So very good offense on, on both sides. And now let's look at the defensive numbers here. Uh, the Dolphins down here. The Eagles just about right in the middle. The definition of average. Uh, the Dolphins have not done a good job stopping the run in terms of the run defense. And they are very average in pass defense. So the point is two very good offenses, two uh Average at best defense is, 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 I think, how you could characterize um, the, the Eagles and the Dolphins' defense. If you want to know the actual numbers, Eagles' defense is 11th in opponent yards per play, 17th in opponent EPA per play. The Dolphins are 19th in opponent yards per play and 23rd in opponent EPA per play. So all of this is to say, I think we're in for a fun offensive shootout on Sunday Night Football. I think we're going to see plenty of points. Um... I might be getting ahead of myself saying this because this, I mean, I don't want to compare it to the greatest offensive game of all time. My favorite NFL game, regular season NFL game of all time, which was the Rams Chiefs. I think it was Thursday night football uh, from, from a few seasons ago when there was like 105 points scored. I'm just saying I wouldn't be shocked if we get 80 points scored in this game. If you want to get crazy and bet an alternate total, this is the game to do it. I think we're going to see an unbelievable back and forth office of shooter of the game. So I'm going to take the over. Let's root for points. It's one of the best teams in the AFC against one of the best teams in the NFC. Two fun offenses. Let's root for points. That brings me to the final game of the week, which is Monday Night Football Vikings 49ers. If you've been watching this and listening to the show on a weekly basis, you already know who I'm going to bet. I'm going to continue to bet the Vikings until I think odds makers are rightfully uh, evaluating them, and I still don't think they are. I'll take the seven points. If I bet on every Vikings game by the end of the season, they're probably just going to—I'm probably just going to be like nine and eight betting on them. But still, I mean, I can't help it. Seven point underdogs at home on Monday Night Football. I will take the seven points. I was tempted to take them out right. You'd be a fool if you think I didn't thought. Uh, if you think I didn't think about it, but I'll take the seven points. Uh, if they had Justin Jefferson, I think I would have taken them to win outright. They're still seventh in the NFL in net yards per play, and I think the 49ers. I think this is. A, I think it's time to sell high. Uh, last week I was right with betting on the Browns, um, even though I had them at a terrible line of plus five. I think now. I think the 49ers peaked in the first five weeks of the season. Now that's not to say they can't start peaking again by the time the playoffs start. But they're, I think they showed they're not going to play the same way that they played the first five weeks for the entire season. Now, a big reason for that is injuries. Uh, who know? I do not know, as of recording this on Monday night, who is going to play and who isn't. But what I do know is they have Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, and Trent Williams all listed as questionable. If any of those three guys don't play, you're going to see line. You're going to see the line move, and the and you're going to you're not going to get be able to get the Vikings at at plus seven. So if you like the Vikings. I would say bet it now because I don't think that even by Tuesday afternoon, there may not be even sevens available. As of recording this, there are still sevens available. Let me just look, see to find one as proof. There's still plus seven at FanDuel. DraftKings has them plus six and a half. So the sevens are disappearing. I would do it sooner rather than later because there's not going to be any injury news that's going to help this line for the Vikings. I think they can still move the ball enough through the air, even without Justin Jefferson. I think the 49ers are kind of hitting a little bit of a slump. They can still win the game. I'll take the seven points of the Vikings. Vikings plus seven, minus 110 against the 49ers. There you go. That was my best bet for all 13 NFL Week 7 games. Uh, my best bets, my five best bets... Um, and I stick to spreads when I give out best bets for the most part because I know a lot of people like to take these best bets for their pick'em contests, and pick'ems generally, at least, I mean, the two that I'm in, are spreads only, so I like to just kind of stick to spreads. Uh, so my best bets are Ravens minus three against Lions, Packers minus one versus Broncos, Seahawks minus seven and a half against the Cardinals, Chargers plus six versus the Chiefs, and Vikings plus seven versus the 49ers. So that's Ravens, Packers, Seahawks, Chargers, Vikings all to cover. 
if you want to do a total bet there instead, I would substitute out the Packers over the Broncos, and I would sub in uh, the over between uh, the Eagles and the Dolphins. Um, I didn't recap my pick. Sorry about that. Let me go ahead and recap them. I'm on the Saints minus one against the Jaguars at minus 110. Still like them at minus three. Uh, Browns, Colts under 39 and a half, minus 110. Bills minus eight and a half, minus 110 at New England. Raiders, Bears over 37 and a half, minus 105. Commanders minus two, minus 108 at the Giants. Falcons plus two and a half, minus 106 at the Buccaneers. Uh, Ravens minus three, minus 110 at home to the Lions. Seahawks minus seven and a half, minus 110 at home to the Cardinals. Steelers, Rams over 43, minus 110. Packers minus one, minus 110 at the Broncos. Dolphins, Eagles over 52, minus 110. And Vikings plus seven, minus 110 at home to the 49ers. Uh, my teaser bet of the week, uh, and I don't know what my record is. It's definitely a winning record. I want to say I'm, I think I'm four and two on teaser so far this season. Um, I'm going to take the Falcons from two and a half up to eight and a half and the Seahawks down from eight to minus two against the Cardinals. So the six point teaser of the week, Falcons plus eight and a half against the Bucks and Seahawks minus two against the Cardinals crossing we're crossing key numbers for both those teams of three and seven um I don't think the Buccaneers have it in them to blow out the Falcons and I don't think the Cardinals can keep it within a field goal of the Seahawks if you're still alive in a survivor pool congratulations because man it must be a bloodbath let me see uh let me check in on Joe Ostrowski's survivor pool and see how many entries are left now there's a better chance of you still being alive if you're in a survivor pool where you can buy back in but if you're in one like Joe Ostrowski's where you can't buy back in, uh, congratulations if you're still left. Um, 431 people are left still in that one. Oh, this week actually not that many people were on the Eagles and the 49ers. So I'm surprised not that many people were on the 49ers this week, especially when uh, Deshaun Watson was ruled out. Um, so 431 people. So that's, I don't know what the percentage of that is. I think there's 1,700 entries. So what's that? Uh, one quarter of the people are left about approximately. Uh, if you are still alive in your survivor pool, the two picks I like in survivor this week, let me just, uh, bring it up here. I think the Seahawks at home to the Cardinals is an obvious pick. Uh, I love that pick. Uh, if you want to get a little sneaky with it, uh, Raiders at the bears, only a three point favorite. There's obviously no other situation. You're going to want to take the Raiders in, but they get to play in Chicago uh, against a Bears team that will likely not have Justin Fields. The only hope the Bears have in any game, for the most part, is to have Justin Fields. Now, am I rushing to lay three points on on a Raiders team against anyone? No. But if we're just t talking Survivor, we're just talking win the game, unless this rookie guy who tore up D2 is uh, the real deal, the Bears are probably in for a world of hurt. So... Raiders, if you want a sneaky pick. Seahawks, if you want an obvious pick, would be the two teams I would go with in Survivor. Uh, there you have it. That has been the NFL Week 7 episode of the Bacon Bets podcast. Please like the video, subscribe to the channel, rate and review the podcast. Uh, I love you all. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, gamble or bless. Good luck with all your picks this week, whether you fade me, uh, tail me, or make your own picks. Best of luck. Uh, I will talk to you all next week because the road to 272 bets marches on.